It's ready. All right. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the meeting of the Sentencing Guidelines Commission for March 9th, 2023. We're holding a hybrid meeting uh, under, as we are allowed to do so under state law. I'm going to ask uh, Nate to go ahead and take the roll. Roll call, Estrada. Present. Estrada, present. Ibrahim? Present. Ibrahim, present. Knudsen? Present. Knudsen, present. Lad? Present. Lad, present. Larkin? Present. Larkin, present. Middlebrook? Present. Middlebrook, present. Moore? Moore? Moore, uh, are you, can you hear me? He does his mute on. Justice Moore, can you hear me? Justice Moore, I'm going to unmute you. All right, Justice Moore, I just unmuted you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Nick, are you able to hear me? I am, but are you not unable to unmute yourself? Is that the problem? Uh, <clears throat> I think, I don't know. Sometimes when I switch between Zoom and WebEx, the microphone configuration is different. So if you're able to hear me now, I'm able to hear you as well. Okay, um, more present. And yeah, feel free to mute. Present. Sorry for the delay. That, that's fine. Uh, feel free to mute yourself at this time. Morath? Present. Morath, present. Schnell? Present. Schnell, present. Chair Mitchell? Present. Chair Mitchell, present. Madam Chair, there are 10 members present, one seat vacant, no members absent. Great. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, the first item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. So I'd entertain a motion for that. So moved. Commissioner Schnell makes a motion. Commissioner Middlebrook seconds that motion. Any discussion on the agenda? Hearing none, I'll take a vote. To the Schnell motion to approve the agenda, Estrada? Yes. Estrada, yes. Ibrahim? Yes. Ibrahim, yes. Knudsen? Yes. Knudsen, yes. Lad? Yes. Lad, yes. Larkin? Yes. Larkin, yes. Middlebrook? Yes. Middlebrook, yes. Moore? Yes. Moore, yes. Morath? Yes. Morath, yes. Schnell? Yes. Schnell, yes. Chair Mitchell? Yes. Chair Mitchell, yes. Madam Chair, there are 10 votes in favor, no votes opposed. And with that, the uh, agenda is approved unanimously. We'll move on to approval of the draft meeting minutes from February 9th. You should have all received those uh, last week. Um, and barring, so you should have had time to review them. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes. It's a moves approval. Commissioner Knudsen moves to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Middlebrook uh, seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll take the vote. To the Knutson motion to approve the February 9th meeting minutes, Estrada? I was not present, so I will refrain from voting. Estrada abstains. Ibrahim? Approve. Ibrahim, yes. Knutson? Yes. Knutson, yes. Lad? I too will abstain because I was absent from that meeting. Lad abstains. Larkin? Larkin? Oh, I'm sorry, I said approve. Okay, yes. uh, Larkin votes yes. Middlebrook? Yes. Middlebrook, yes. Moore? Yes. Moore, yes. Morath? Yes. Morath, yes. Schnell? Yes. Schnell, yes. Chair Mitchell? Yes. Chair Mitchell, yes. Madam Chair, there are eight votes in favor, no votes opposed, two abstentions. And with that, the motion is approved. All right, we have a short agenda today. We um, 
main purpose of our meeting is just to make sure that the commission is up to speed on everything that's going on in the legislature. Eventually, we'll have to act on some of these items. Uh, so I uh, wanted to make sure that you're aware of the activities at the legislature, and it also gives an opportunity should the commission uh, want to take a position on any of the legislation that's going through, uh, now would be the time to do that. So I'm going to um, hand it over to Nate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, you, you uh, that was <laughs> my, that, that, no, that was my uh, <laughs> preamble, so I'll move right in. So um, just, just, so I'm looking now at 4A, and particularly this is a version of 4A that I just sent out yesterday. So if you're looking at the version that's dated March 2nd, that's now obsolete. This is, this is the current version. And this, this version is on our website for the public, um, dated March 8th, uh, 2023. One of the bills is missing from this list because it's been promoted to the other list, basically. There's been, there's been action taken on it. We were asked to do a fiscal note. So, so that's now on the other list. Uh, so these are... These are bills that are out there that directly affect the, the work of the sentencing guidelines or the application of the sentencing guidelines. I'm sorry, the work of the commission or application of the sentencing guidelines, and they aren't included in, in, in the other list. Um, now, two of these uh, affect the, the application of the sentencing guidelines because they have to do with mandatory minimum sentences, which, which do alter how the sentencing guidelines are applied. So I'm, I'm kind of construing that a little bit broadly. Those are the, the first and third on this list. Both of those harden uh, mandatory minimums. And by harden, I mean they make them non waivable Currently, most mandatory minimums, although they're called mandatory, are, are waivable if, if uh, usually the standard is if substantial and compelling reasons exist and can be articulated, then, then the, the mandatory minimum may be waived. But these, these are not man, uh, waivable mandatory minimums uh, as, as the bill would have it. Um, Senate file 1059 would, would harden uh, 6 and 9 11 um, mandatory minimums, which are firearms or dangerous weapons, and, and specifically those mandatory minimums pertaining to firearms would be non waivable. So, felon in possession of a firearm, for example, very common uh, uh, offense on that list that always involves a firearm would always involve a presumptive commit to the, uh, would, would always involve a commit to the Commission of Corrections if the law were followed. Um, the um, uh, the, 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 there is a limited exception if the firearm was carried by accomplice, an accomplice and the, uh, the defendant was unaware of, of that fact. Uh, Senate file 1960 and, and uh, now has a House companion. Um, the Sentencing Guidelines Commission must conduct a racial impact screening on all bills that may affect the racial composition of the criminal offender population. As the Commission is well aware, there are there are two gates that, uh, that, that these have to pass through under our current policy. One is uh, the, the bill has to meet the significance criterion. There no, there's no significance criterion in this bill. Um, and, and, and the second gate is that we have to be able to do it. Uh, so we have to have evidence that, um, that allows us to make a, a, a reasonable uh, estimate of the demographic population. Um, and there's, there's no requirement like that in this bill either. Um, so, um, can I ask a question about that one? Yes. <laughs> um, that one feels to me like uh, one that it would be, if, if it comes up for a hearing, it would be useful for you to provide some testimony just on the logistics. Um, because while I, I don't, I, I don't disagree with creating racial demographic impact statements and fast, you know, our commission was the first one in the nation to do that. But what, um, what, what I am concerned about is there are a lot of bills that are introduced that never get a hearing. And so this doesn't seem to differentiate. And so the question would be like, how do we know this is going to be a bill that's really got legs and is gonna move forward? Because I, I think they would have to add like three more staff people mm -hmm. if they want us to actually do this yeah. for every bill, right? Well, I'm sure that you, you, uh, you raised an excellent point. I, I actually omitted the first gate. There, there's another gate before either of those two gates, and that is that it has to be, ha have enough uh, life in the legislative process or legs to have gotten a fiscal note. Uh, because oh. uh, unless and until we get a fiscal note, uh, yeah. that's, that's sort of the triggering event. Once we do a fiscal note, that's when we figure out how many 
new prison beds or reduced prison beds or um, what, what the change in the felony population. And that brings us to the second gate, which is, is it significant? But you're right, it has to have, it has to have legislative viability, it has to be significant and it has to be doable. Um, none of those three things are required in this bill. So um, yeah, that's, I, I, yeah, you're right. If, if the commission did not take a position on this bill and it did come up for a hearing, I think I would present the demographic impact statement policy to the committee and testify just explaining what it is we do so they have kind of a, under, a, a baseline understanding of the status quo. So, so I, Madam Chair, I, I, I like you, I'm, I'm very concerned about this. Uh, just from the description, I tried to review as a, a number of the actual language or the uh, or the Senate uh, Council uh, summary of the bills, but um, this one seems it doesn't it doesn't limit them to felony. It just says criminal offenders, and um, it says all bills, and it's got a shell. And so that's what uh, concerns me uh, about the impact uh, that it would have on our workload and on our staff. Unlike the language that we've got uh, for our um, for providing the racial impact at this time, or the demographic impact that we do now. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And if I may say one more thing, I mean, I, I. I agree from, from staff's point of view, I certainly agree. I mean, it's, if the legislation will have a racial impact, well, every bill that has an impact will have a racial impact. I mean, if it has an impact on a human, mm -hmm. um, th there will be some kind of racial impact. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be a lot of bills. And I'm assuming that if this bill did get a committee hearing, we would be asked to do a fiscal note. And in that fiscal note, we would, we would ask for additional staff um, as, as part of the cost of the bill. I don't know if well, they'll realize there's a fiscal note, a fiscal impact. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you, so the, the, the system now fairly recently, uh, starting with last year is, is there's an entity called the legislative budget office. That's an organ of the legislature as opposed to an organ of the executive branch. And that, um, They've been very responsive, as, as was their executive predecessor, but they've been very responsive. If we notice that there's a bill coming up for a hearing and we're like, oh, this is going to have, usually it's, it's this is going to have a, a, a correctional impact. You know, there will be some new felonies created or something like this. We asked to be put on the fiscal note. I've never had them say no. They always, they always put us on the fiscal note. So I, if, if we saw this coming, we would ask to be put on the fiscal note. I'm assuming they would put us on the fiscal note. Well, keep an eye on this one, Nate. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think we might, it might, I think we should probably reach out to the authors mm -hmm. and just have a little discussion behind the scenes about some of those concerns, too, because um, there might be changes that they could make to the language that would make this a little bit more doable for us, like limiting it to felonies, as, as Commissioner Knudsen said, and um, right. Well, that would be part of the significance key. Um, but I mean, it does say we have to develop a protocol. So they may think they, that may give us the room that we need to um, have a structure for this, but I'm not uh, sure about that. I don't know. Um, I mean, doing the fiscal note, I would assume, as, as, uh, as uh, Commissioner Knudsen said, uh, I would assume this, this would require us to screen every single uh, legislation that would affect the criminal. I mean, we'd have to screen every bill to see if it has a potential impact on the racial composition of the criminal offender population. Um, one, one other thing I would say about this bill, Madam Chair, yeah. and that is that this is a perennial. Uh, Senator Dibble has introduced this bill multiple times oh. in previous sessions. So um, if, if you wanted to reach out to Senator Dibble on this, um, to, to sort of make it a better bill going forward, we could do that. But but this is not this is not a new a new thing. Um, I don't recall Representative Fraser. Um, it, it's possible that that he has been on on the bill before, but but I do know that Senator Dibble always introduces this bill. Um, 
I'm glad that they're interested I shouldn't in say the racial always. impact because they should be. Yeah. All right. Um, so moving on then to 4B, and again, this is also updated as of uh, March 8th. And if I could just explain the, the colorful, uh, it's not to get you in a, you know, Easter mood or something. It's, uh, it's the, the, the point of the color coding here is highlighting in green is um, uh, th those are changed since February. So, so this is basically everything that we submitted to you in February updated and added to. So anything highlighted in green is changed since February or added since February. And then highlighted in blue is changed or added since last week, since the March 2nd version of this document. Um, so the, uh, that, that, that expansion of uh, privacy invading photography, basically reversing state versus McReynolds, uh, to the 2022 Minnesota Supreme Court case, uh, has now passed the House, so it's ready for Senate action. Um, the marijuana bill continues to move through. Uh, no, no really significant changes there to, to uh, criminal justice policy, still 38 beds safe. Um, the labor trafficking bill, which includes your recommendation, uh, has passed the House, uh, so it's also ready for Senate action. The catalytic converter bill has passed both the House and the Senate, but the versions are a little bit different. Uh, as of yesterday, a uh, conference committee has not been appointed, so I'm not, I'm not sure if there's a plan for one to accept the amendments of the other or if they're going to a conference committee. I, I, I guess I would assume since they passed different versions, it has to go to a conference committee. But, well, no, I guess the, I guess it'll go back to the other chamber and then they can accept the, the last changes that were made. Um, let's see, no changes here. Um, unless, unless you want to talk about these, like, we, we talked about them last time, the qualified domestic violence related offense list, um, the uh, using a felony, using, if, if, you're, if your firearm ends up uh, doing something bad to somebody else, you can be held criminally liable for it if it was, uh, if it was not secured in a manner that the bill requires. Um, another, another firearms uh, bill that, that creates a, a felony, just, um, I'm, I'm always, I, I'll just say, Madam Chair, if we have the time for it, uh, a little editorializing is, um, there, there's, there's sort of this creep of uh, gross misdemeanors turning into felonies and um, it doesn't seem like much, but it, but it adds up over time. Um, the, uh, the kidnapping bill, which I think, I think is really uh, a, a good bill for lining up with the sentencing guidelines uh, has, uh, has been heard and laid over. I, I, I guess it's going to be part of the uh, omnibus bill both chambers, although I, I don't think it has a fiscal impact. The organized retail theft bill uh, is still moving through the House, hasn't, uh, hasn't uh, moved through the Senate yet. Um, just to ask you to sort of take a look at these 11 beds for the burglary. So there's, there's basically two parts of the bill. There's 58 beds for um, sophisticated shoplifting, basically shoplifting for a purpose other than consumption of the thing that you stole. Um, so shoplifting in order to sell it or return it to the store or something like that. Uh, that, that is organized retail theft. So it's more serious. Um, if it's a misdemeanor, it turns into a gross misdemeanor, gross misdemeanor turns into a felony and so forth. Uh, 58 prison beds for that. Uh, but there are also 11 prison beds for this burglary, which is, um, where you're, you're told to leave a store and not return and you return within a year and shoplift. Uh, that's that's 11 prison beds. Just keep in mind, keep that in mind because that'll come up later. Um, fourth degree assault, um, a, a, another another sort of uh, expansion of felonies. So uh, the felony fourth degree assault, which is fourth degree assault, is basically misdemeanor assault, but there's something about the victim that's in a special status, and because of that special status, it's elevated either to a gross misdemeanor or a felony. And this would expand fourth degree assault victims uh, to include healthcare providers. Right now, it's just emergency room healthcare providers. Um, and and I, honestly, just reading fourth degree assault, I, it's a little hard for, for me to discern exactly 
what is the population that they're trying to protect with that bill, with that, with that particular statute. Um, there's going to be another fourth degree assault bill uh, later on. Um, the, uh, we, we talked about this one uh, 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 for, for a little bit at the last meeting. This is the one that's redefining felony to be a crime for which a sentence of imprisonment for one year or more may be imposed as, to more than, as opposed to more than one year. And that would take effect immediately. Um, so that has passed the, the uh, House, so it's just waiting for Senate action. Um, the, uh, nothing too much new on the deep fake, uh, bill just continuing to move through. Um, the, uh, I, I know this is supposed to be, uh, significant bills. I, I guess I'm including the gross misdemeanor school bus sticker rejection sticker regulation, uh, bill, uh, as, as a matter of completeness, because we were asked to do a fiscal note on that, but I don't actually think that's a significant bill. Um, House File 3, Senate File 3 had to do with elections. They established gross misdemeanors for voter intimidation, false information, or interference. There's no fiscal impact, uh, if, if I may say. I think that's because those, those things are already criminalized um, at some level in, in existing statute. Um, 1406, a really interesting bill. I, was, I will just say, as a matter of full disclosure, I was on the task, the aiding and abetting felony murder task force so I participated in the report that, that caused this bill. It, eliminates, it limits criminal liability for felony murder uh, committed by an accomplice, and it applies retroactively. So depending on whether it's first or second degree, there's an additional uh, state of mind that, that has to be involved. For, for first degree murder, where the, where the person doing the killing has to have intended to kill, um, that's now also required of the accomplice. The accomplice will have to have intended to kill. Um, for second degree murder, the accomplice has to, um, <coughs> there has to be something about the accomplice's actions that, that sort of set the stage for the death to have occurred. Uh, it, so it's not merely enough to have um, been an accomplice to a felony and then a death resulted in the felony. Um, so that's, that's moving on. It looks like that'll be part of the omnibus bills. There's a savings of 18 beds. And uh, the, that's, a, that's an eventual savings. There will actually be a little bit more, um, more prison beds than that saved at, at, in some of the earlier years because there's, it's immediately retroactive. Um, and uh, uh, so the obstructing a police officer uh, also includes uh, some non-police officers like uh, revenue employees. This is adding DVS employees to that. Uh, minimal impact. There's a bill here that uh, permits prosecutors to petition for mitigated uh, resentencing for substantial and compelling reasons. It's not required that prosecutors do that. It's just giving them uh, a, a, a procedure by which they may do that if they believe it's fair. Uh, other states have done this. It doesn't really happen that much. The 10 cases resentenced annually, that's an estimate that we made based on looking at California and how, uh, how many times this has happened in California. The law has been around a few years in California. And, and uh, proportionally to our inmate population, uh, it would be about 10 cases resentenced annually if, if it's consistent with California. Um, House file 1300, Senate file 1325, very interesting bill. Uh, for juveniles with long sentences uh, or life, so, so these could be life sentences or sort of the functional equivalent of life sentences where you get a lot of consecutive sentences stacked onto each other, very long sentences. Uh, it, it, this, this says that if, if the defendant, that the inmate was a juvenile at the time that he or she committed the crime, uh, that person will, regardless of, of whether it was life without the possibility of release or what it may have been, uh, will be looked at for supervised release after 15 years. Uh, it hasn't been acted on. We were asked to do a fiscal note on it, though. So I don't know what I don't know whether it's got legs or not. We did estimate a 23 bed uh, prison savings. House file 1319, Senate file 1352. We talked a little bit before it was on the other document last month. Uh, it allows cancellation of uh, and, and you, uh, Commissioner Schnell, you can correct me if I'm misstating this, but it, it allows cancellation of one sixth of a prison sentence. That is to say, of the, the pronounced sentence, right now you, you have to serve essentially two thirds of it. 
um, for the most in, in most cases. This would allow you to to reduce one sixth of that pie, so it would be one half of it that you'd have to serve. Um, and uh, if if you comply with an individual rehabilitation plan, so right now there's no incentive to to rehabilitate yourself while you're in prison. Uh, you, you can just do the time and, and you'll get out at the same time. So, so what this does is it, it, it incentivizes uh, compliance with an individual rehabilitation plan with the hopes of reducing recidivism. Um, it also, and, and that is canceled. So that, that time will never have to be served. Uh, there's also an abatement process where one third of the supervised release term, so one ninth of the total sentence, one, one third of one, one third basically, um, can can be abated via compliance with the individual's supervision plan. So that's kind of the same thing, but on the supervision side. Um, it's a, well, it's a little different because you're still under you're still under the authority of the commission. Right. The Commissioner of Corrections is that under supervision. Inactive. Right. So the so that right. So unlike unlike the prison sentence where it's canceled, the the supervision time is is merely abated. So. Um, I guess you'd still be on paper um, for, for, you know, te technically being supervised, but, but there wouldn't be any active supervision during that last uh, ninth of your sentence, I guess, U up to a ninth. I mean, it's, it's, it's not that you're guaranteed the whole amount. It really depends on the extent to which you work the plan. Um, that has been heard in both the House and Senate Crime Committees, although there wasn't a bill when they heard it in the Senate. So informational only. Informational only, but, but it's, it's, it's been moving. Uh, so I, I gave it credit for moving through committees. Um, sports betting um, authorizes sports betting, but establishes uh, misdemeanor, gross misdemeanor, and felony penalties for unauthorized wagers, depending on how big the wager was. We estimated no fiscal impact uh, because we assumed that essentially the increase in felonies for unauthorized wagers is going to be offset by the reduction in felonies for um, illegal sports bookmaking, which is going to be reduced significantly if it's not legal. Um, uh, House File 1607 makes the commission's presumptive five-year probation cap non-waivable and requires the commission to conform the guidelines accordingly, which is almost redundant because that's, uh, for, for those who don't know, that's what we're going to be doing in, in, uh, in the coming months is figuring out exactly how we need to conform the guidelines to whatever it is that the legislature does this session. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of a, that kind of goes without saying, but they're saying it anyway, which is fine. Um, so I, I know, I know you've been involved in, in uh, well, I think you've been involved with this one, Madam Chair. I don't know if there's anything, any details about this you, you had to say, but it's, it's, at least as the bill was introduced, it was pretty consistent with the, the sentencing guidelines rule. It's just that instead of having that substantial compelling reasons opt out, uh, it's, it's now not, uh, it's not optional. It is, a, it is a jurisdictional limit of five years for probation. Well, I just want to, I'm not involved in that. I'm not leading this effort, but I have, yes, responded to questions about this bill that was brought forward. Consulted, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yes. Um, so this is the one I told you to keep an eye on the other bills. So this is the that gross misdemeanor burglary for shoplifting within a year of being, being told to leave and not return, and a felony if a prior theft-related conviction. That's that's basically a subpart of the previous bill so it's the, it's the 11 beds but it's not 11 more beds if you're if you're adding up everything in the right column you know to see whether it's a net increase or decrease in prison beds don't add up this 11 twice because that would be double counting this this these 11 beds are the same as those other 11 beds there's a bill that hasn't had any action on but we were asked to do a fiscal note uh, that would establish uh, identical weight thresholds for fentanyl uh, as now exist for heroin in the controlled substance crimes. Um, that's a five bed cost. There's a, there's a new bill that clarifies that computer theft includes copying data, not just taking data. Um, 
So House File 2201 does not, as of last time I checked, have a Senate companion. It's an interesting bill. Unlike all the other bills that we're talking about today that have, you know, essentially an impact that we help estimate, uh, but the cost is borne by Commissioner Schnell, not by us, um, this, or, or, or by probation agencies throughout the state. That's another bearer of the cost. Um, and jails. Um, but the, the, uh, this has a direct fiscal impact on this agency, the, the, that, uh, the Sentencing Guidelines Commission. Uh, so it, it has two parts. One is a short-term part and one is a long-term part. Both are trying to do the same thing, which is um, look at the impact of, of bail processes in the state of Minnesota and, and really, really create an entity that's going to going to drill down and look at how that's going in terms of uh, fairness and, um, you know, impact on, on different communities and so forth. Um, and uh, it, it's an interesting project. So the first part is that is a research grant that we would administer for a, a, some nonprofit research entity that would that would look at this, they, they'd analyze it, they, they do all the research on figuring out you know, what the parameters are of this, and then we would and analyze the resulting data and report that to the legislature. Then going forward, the judicial branch would have to collect and submit to us um, all these different data points, There's at least 20 different data points on every criminal case as I'm reading the bill. So every criminal case would have to be submitted uh, 20 data points. Some would have to be submitted more than that if they actually had stuff going on with bail, but but even if they didn't have stuff going on with bails, I'm reading it uh, 20 different data points. So that's like a total of over 8 million data points um, that, that we'd get every year that we'd have to analyze and report on. Um, so there is going to be an impact, a fiscal impact uh, to the commission to, to do this. Um, we're estimating that it would, at, well, I shouldn't say what we're estimating because we don't have the the fiscal note done, but I, I think it will require additional research staff at a minimum and possibly some IT costs to to uh, handle the new data. Um, I was, you know, I forgot that you, I think you sent this to me a while ago and I forgot to respond to you. Because um, the piece that really confused me was, and I don't know if this one has legs or not, but the piece that really confused me was like giving funding to some outside organization to do a study, but then we also have to analyze that data. Like, I mean, this, mm -hmm. the ongoing analysis, I understand, but it was that first one, it looked like we also had to analyze the data that this outside grant recipients analyzed. So that part was, did that make sense to you? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 well, the way I read it is they basically have the first crack at it and then they report it to us, and then we we take it, um, and and maybe we just pass it along as is, or maybe we add our own observations, and we report it to the legislature by I think it's March fifteenth of, of uh, I want to say twenty twenty four, um, and and right yeah twenty twenty four. So um, and then after that. It, be that the source of the data wouldn't be this nonprofit right. research entity, it would be the judicial branch. So I, I'd love to know what the, I know the judicial branch is working on this fiscal note too, trying to figure out what it's going to cost, but these aren't data points that they current, I don't think, I can't speak for the judicial branch, but I don't know that they capture all this data right now. So they would have to come up with a way of capturing it and reporting it to us. And and we are assuming that they would give us the data that the bill requires us to give or, or I mean, if, if we had to go fishing for it, it would be a significantly different uh, fiscal impact. The reason, one of the reasons why we're looking at the impact we have is one of the things they don't have to give us the data for is the, um, I'm gonna pull up the bill here. So the, the pretrial evaluation form or data contained in the form. Uh, including but not limited to the pretrial risk assessment score. So we're assuming that they're going to do the, the easier of those two things and just give us the form and say, here, you, you, you fish out the data. So, so we're going to have to be looking at all these pretrial uh, 
evaluation forms. And this isn't just in convictions. This is in charges. So this is going to be, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of cases a year, not necessarily all that have bail evaluations, but, but hundreds of thousands of criminal cases that we're going to have to look at whether they have bail evaluations or not. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's definitely an order of magnitude larger than, than the scope that we deal with because it deals with non-felonies and it deals with pre-sentence. Um, I'm not saying, I don't, I don't, I hope nothing I'm saying is construed as saying it's not a good bill. I think it's very interesting. I think it would be very interesting to, to, to look at all this. And although data matching to our data set is not part of the bill's requirement, I think it'd be really interesting if we did. I, I think, I think this could really um, make, make uh, possible some really interesting research for the commission to do. Um, and, and I, you know, so I don't know. Do you have time for a minor digression? <laughs> so, so, okay, so my, 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 my first day on the job is a Friday. On Sunday, I was going to the NAS conference in Connecticut uh, back in 2014. And I recall at the NAS conference, somebody talking about, um, I, I believe it was the Manhattan District Attorney's Office that was concerned about their, their uh, racial uh, disparities and their in sort of the outcomes of their office. And they opened up the, the books to some outside entity to look at everything. And one of the areas that they found um, uh, caused some of these problems was in the setting of bail. And, and so it's, it's, it's something that really has a lot of downstream effects. Uh, so I, uh, I, I think it would be really, really interesting to, to look at some of, this issue, some of these issues. Um, final bill that I've got on here, although I, I, I do have one bill that I, I would have put on there if I was aware of it yesterday, um, would enhance a, a, the physical assault of a peace officer, which is now a gross misdemeanor. Um, again, the, the inherent crime is a misdemeanor, but because the victim is a peace officer under the fourth degree assault statute, it becomes a gross misdemeanor. This bill would, would change that to a two-year felony. Uh, we're estimating eight beds. Seven of those beds are from the increase of the gross misdemeanor to a felony. One of those beds is uh, because we're assuming that the commission, so right now the commission has the felony version of this crime, which is if there's demonstrable bodily harm or I think the transfer of bodily fluids, uh, that's, that's ranked at a severity level one offense. And I think that's a, is that a three-year step max? Four year yes, stat max, three. three year stat max. So, this is a two year stat max. And we're assuming that, sort of, to preserve a distinction between those the two year stat max new offense and the three year stat max existing offense, that the commission might very well bump the existing offense from a one to a two. And that's where the that eighth bed would come in. All right. So, um, that is almost the end of my legislative update. Uh, for, for that portion of the agenda. But uh, I do want to share with you Senate file 1934, which I was not tracking until just this morning when I saw it was coming up for a hearing, I think next week. Um, and I am concerned about it. So Senate file 1934, I, I, I learned a little bit about what, what it might be about, but um, let me just give you some background here. 609.14 is, is uh, called, it's a statute called Re revocation of stay. And it kind of walks the, the parties and the judge through what to do if, if somebody's um, charged with violating a condition of probation. Uh, you know, what are the circumstances under which you can uh, revoke probation and so forth. And, uh, and what the bill does, as I'm understanding it, is it, inclu it includes within the scope of 609.14 um, stays of adjudication, not just stays of imposition, stays of execution. Um, so I, I, I've got no quarrel with the policy behind the bill, but from a technical st standpoint, I'm, I'm very concerned about the bill the way it's written um, because um, there's already plenty of confusion um, about stays of adjudication and, and how to revoke stays of adjudication. So under the sentencing guidelines, a stay of adjudication, uh, uh, the sentencing guidelines do not apply to a stay of adjudication. 
Why? Because there hasn't been a conviction yet. So you're really not being sentenced yet under the sentencing guidelines when you're being placed on probation for a state of adjudication. That sentencing will only occur when you get revoked. Uh, so we end up having judges who are confused about why we're asking them to file a departure report. Um, they, you know, they'd be like, this is, this person's, I'm sending this person to prison because it's their umpteenth probation violation. And, uh, you know, I, they, 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 they've had enough chances and, and they're ready to go to prison. And the response to that is, the problem with that is, once you revoke the state of adjudication, then you have to sentence the person because they haven't been convicted, they haven't been sentenced yet. And once you're sentencing that person, you have to sentence them under the sentencing guidelines. Um, if we're going to include states of adjudication under 609.14, I think it's really important to make a reference to that fact that, uh, and I can pull up 609.14 if you like, but, but uh, let's see, 609.14, um, Six hundred nine fourteen subdivision three says if you know basically gives the court direction on what to do if somebody's been revoked, and it doesn't say anything about states of adjudication. So there really has to be just some amendment to subdivision three, in my opinion, that, that references that. So my plan is to talk to the Senate Council before the hearing next week and ask if subdivision three can't be amended um, to to include some kind of guidance to the courts on what to do if the, the stay that's being revoked here is a, is a stay of a stay of adjudication. Um, and I can certainly pull up these uh, these provisions, Madam Chair, if that would be more clear. Um, but, yeah, sure. Okay. And while he's doing that, um, I will say that it's my understanding that uh, the reason this bill has been brought uh, what 609.14 also does is it allows for if somebody has a uh, violation during the period of probation but it does not come up until after probation is over, 609.14 allows that violation to still be brought before the court within six months, within six months uh, following the end of the probationary term. So it's my understanding the author's concern is that there was a state of adjudication case where that hearing did not occur prior to the end of the stay. And uh, they want to be able to, they want, they want to fix that loophole. I think the author's not understanding that there are other issues here though. So yeah. I think it's good to bring those up. Yeah, so, so here's the bill. It's a very short bill. It just adds a subdivision to 609.14 that says, when we're talking about stay in this, in this section, we mean state of adjudication as well as a state of imposition or state of execution. Um, and here's, um, here's 60914. And my concern here is, is, and maybe there are other some concerns. I, I haven't had a lot of time to look at this, but my concern here is subdivision three that says, you know, it's, it's the what if, or, or the so what part of the bill or the, of the section. If any grounds are found to exist, that is grounds for revocation of the stay, here are the court's options. The court can, um, if there was a stay of imposition, the court can and can continue that, or the court can uh, impose the sentence and stay the execution. And in either of those two events, put the defendant on probation or order intermediate sanctions, or the court can impose the sentence and execute meaning send the defendant to prison. So, so the court has a, a, a broad spectrum of options from keeping the stay of imposition, um, vacating the stay and, and imposing the sentence, but, but giving the defendant a stay of execution, which is one step you know, closer to prison, or just imposing the sentence outright. And then uh, subdivision two is talking about what to do if there's a, a stay of execution. If there's a stay of execution, same thing, except you've only got two options. You can either continue the stay of execution or you can order the sentence to be executed. Um, what we need here, in my opinion, is another, sub, is another paragraph under subdivision three that says if it's a stay of execution, if it's a stay of adjudication, the court can either continue the stay of adjudication, revoke the stay, and sentence according to the sentencing statutes. So to me, that's, that's what's missing. Um, and then that would make it clear that the sentencing guy
Any, any questions or discussion about that, Madam Chair? Anyone have any questions? All right, so is that the end? Is that all the bills? That's all the bills. I, I, I think there's still some, shoot, I don't have the agenda, but. Um, no, I was going to ask if, I just wanted to see if I'm yep. going to ask the commission, like pause here if that's the end of the bills. That, that's it for 4A and 4B. Okay, okay. so um, just to, to give, just to make it very obvious, if there's anyone on the commission who's, who's interested in supporting a bill or taking a position on the bills in support or opposition, now would be the time to bring that up. So I just want to open that up to ask if there's anything that anyone wants to talk about taking a position on or if there's any, any bills you want to talk about any oh. further. All right, not hearing anything. You, you had another point? Um, well, it, it does tie into the next agenda uh, sub item 4C. Your executive director? No, 4C has to do 4C. with uh, recommendations, the status of the commission's recommendations to the legislature. Oh. So um, I, I don't have terribly good news to report. We, we have the, um, the the one fairly technical change that's going forward in the, that, that had to do with sex trafficking that's going forward in the um, human trafficking bill. Um, and, and, and so that's good news. Uh, the, the rest, we don't really have any anything advancing uh, I will say so if you recall I talked to you about a bill that would that would um, uh, for for juveniles who were sentenced to prison for life um, they, they would be eligible for uh, supervised release as early as 15 years into their sentence um, and I was thinking about testifying on that bill or, or talking to the author in advance of, of whatever hearing I don't think there are any hearings coming up but just pointing out uh, in, in almost a passive aggressive way of saying this bill will not have any impact on 69.2661, first degree murder of an unborn child, uh, because that, that life term is, the, the, the minimum for that life term is not defined by law through an oversight. Um, so it, it, if, if you want to, say when a juvenile who's convicted of 692661 gets out, you really have to start by fixing the problem, which is what we recommend that you do. Um, so uh, to, just to let you know, that's kind of my thought on, on that particular recommendation. But the other recommendations, um, I, I, I think there's interest in some quarters in uh, maybe taking a look at some of these recommendations next year. Um, I, I think they've got a lot going on this year, and I, I, so I think anything that they can push off till next legislative session is, is probably the will of the commission. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I will confess to being a little bit frustrated on the um, the age problem with child prostitution because that's really a no brainer in my opinion. It's just an oversight that they they just missed in the last bill. It could almost be done in, in the revisor's bill, but I don't I don't see that uh, in any bills that are going forward. So that, include, that concludes 4C, Madam Chair. All right. Any other questions on that? Hearing none, let's go ahead and move to D, which is the demographic impact statements. What did you want to tell us there? Uh, just wanted to show you that we do have uh, two demographic impact statements for you in, in your materials. Um, the, let's see. Don't have them in front of me. Um, but uh, I also have a statement of no demographic impact statement, which typically we don't give to the whole commission. Okay, so those are on cannabis and aiding and abetting murder. Um, that, that burglary crimes following trespass notice, we couldn't do a demographic impact analysis on that because we didn't know uh, exactly what the demographic characteristics of that population were going to be. But we did know the demographic uh, characteristics of, of the larger population of people who were convicted of theft um, or trespassing uh, after being charged with both offenses. Um, so we did report that to the legislature for what it's worth. Um, so that's uh, th this under the demographic impact statement, uh, we have to report demographic impact statements to the commission. Uh, 
And if the commission doesn't like it, this is the time for the commission to say so. Otherwise, uh, that the policy says that they will become final after this meeting. Any input or questions there? Let's go ahead and move on to the executive director report then. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so two things to report. One is I still have not been called before the House or Senate uh, crime committees to testify about our budget. As you know, we do have some significant things going on in the budget. And, uh, most impactful to you would be the fact that there's in there the, the phase one of the comprehensive review of the sentencing guidelines, which will which will occupy a lot of our attention going forward. Um, that bill has not been written yet. It's going to be part, I think, of a larger budget bill that, that probably will include the Department of Corrections. Um, and uh, I expect that to be released pretty soon. And I expect to be testifying um, this month uh, before both committees on that. The, the committee deadline for major budget bills is April 4th, uh, right before the legislative spring break. So I, I expect a lot of action in the next month uh, from, from the legislature. And I will say we have had a lot of action. I, I don't know what the count is of uh, fiscal notes, but you kind of get the idea by looking at 4B because just about every one of those involved a, a fiscal note that, that we had to pump out, in some cases multiple fiscal notes if there are multiple versions of the bill. So um, it's, it's been a very busy, frankly, your staff is grateful that, that the commission has has had kind of a light workload for us during this legislative session because we've had all hands on deck uh, working on, on fiscal notes. And, and by the way, we're trying to get out our data reports and, and uh, that sort of stuff. So um, that reminds me. Yes, there are one 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 thing that I I'll just I just want to say for the record is there are a number of bills this year that I've seen where somewhere at the end of the bill is a paragraph that says, and the Sentencing Guidelines Commission shall report on that. <laughs> so um, I just, you know, so I would just say, um, as we move to budget stage, as if those things pass, mm -hmm. or they're part of the budget, the omnibus bill, we need to be asserting that, you know, the accumulated yeah. impact of multiple additional requirements would also need staff to come with it you know so i just want to put that out there we already are asking for staff because we're already understaffed if they add more to our plate right we will again be understaffed if they don't also add staff at that level and i will i will be very candid that i actually said that to legislators directly already so we'll, <laughs> we'll see um, where all that goes yeah i mean and, and the flip side is there this is the I think, I mean, I, this is the state's sort of criminal justice policy committee, you know, the mm -hmm. standing general, you yeah. know, general purpose um, felony policy committee. So it's, it is, uh, it, it does make sense that the legislature would be looking to us. There right. isn't really another entity to, to do that. Um, but yeah. No, I agree. And I, I think there's a lot of really interesting ideas being put forth and um, it's not that I disagree with any of it. Uh, just, you know, at, we just need to advocate for ourselves as if things move forward that we, uh, while we, you know, we definitely would not shirk that responsibility, we would need some additional staffing in order to, make, to get it done. And, and I, 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 I hope I have a good enough uh, relationship with, with the rest of your staff, Madam Chair, that they are quite comfortable in reminding me of that. <laughs> <laughs> We don't, we aren't just sitting around. We don't have extra resources to do extra things. So, um, so we are trying to be mindful of that manager, but I appreciate that comment. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to uh, report on is, is your, uh, your status and well, not, not all of you, but, but uh, that the executive appointees on the commission, uh, what's going on with that. I don't have any updates for you. Unfortunately, I, I was told back in October that the, that the governor had a calendar and uh, you know that was assuming the governor was reelected that the governor's calendar was going to be reappointing members of the appointing or reappointing members of the minnesota sentencing guidelines commission in in april i don't have anything more specific than that uh there was a task i was given to do by march 1st so i did that and i asked them if they had any updates um and they didn't have any updates so um or that 
they didn't respond. So I don't, I can't say they have no, uh, I don't know whether they have an update or not. They, they don't have an update that they were uh, sharing. So, um, so I would assume that uh, at the next meeting, we'll probably be working with the same commission, Madam Chair. So I don't know what, what that means. Uh, I would think we could, I, I, if you're willing, we could look at, say, the calendar. That's something we started to look at in December. Um, the commission's meeting calendar, looking at whether we wanted to change the rules on that. Uh, unless you think that's something that the whole commission should be for, but I don't know. I, I think maybe that's sort of inside baseball enough that the old commission members could could, could move that around uh, without the input of the new commission. I don't know. I'm just trying to think of uh, something we could be doing in April. Otherwise, otherwise, uh, maybe maybe there won't be much to do in April. And uh, so, I guess I'll. Um, let, let you be the judge of that. But that's all I had for the report, Madam Chair. All right. Um, then I think we're down to public input. All right. So members of the public, you should be able to raise your hands. Uh, let me just see who's on. So um, looks like everybody is on on a computer so I don't have to unmute everybody. So uh, for, the, for any member of the public, this is a chance where you have uh, to, to give the commission uh, your, your public input. But to do that, you have to raise your hand. So please uh, look for uh, where it is on, the, on your computer that you can raise your hand, your computer or your smartphone. And uh, for staff members who are uh, listening in, if you could please raise your hand so I can tell that the, the hand raising function is working. I do see some staff members raising their hands. And I'm sure I don't see any members of the public who are raising their hands. So it looks like there's no, uh, no one interested in giving public input today. All right. All right, so um, that really closes us out with the agenda that we had for today. I just want to open up for commission members. Is there anything else that anyone wants to raise before we uh, end our meeting for today? All right, not seeing anything. I promised a short one, and we, we had a short one. So uh, I hope that you all have a, a good month, and we will see you here next month. This meeting is adjourned.